Welcome to the Leadership Experience Podcast, where we seek to build connections, talk relevant issues about warfighting and share professional knowledge through experience and lessons learned with guests from a variety of different professional backgrounds. It's our way to relate to multiple generations within our formation and create real conversations as we build a team of teams committed to winning and dedicated to the pursuit of excellence. We hope you enjoy our content. You can continue to find the Lancer Brigade on Facebook and Instagram and find our podcast content on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts as you search for the Lancer Brigade or the Leadership Experience. Enjoy. Hey team, check it out. Today is part two of our season opener, where we welcome Brock and Elliot Miller. The Miller brothers are extraordinary individuals whose story of personal tragedy and serious injury following an auto accident imbued them with a sense of perspective and resiliency. Captured on ESPN's E60, the brothers' connection to Michigan football, relationship with influential figures in their lives, like previous guest coach Mike Barwis, and willingness to work through adversity saw Brock defying expectations by beating a 1% chance of walking again and Elliot returning to the field. Their contributions today will continue our discussion of true resiliency and grit, no matter the odds stacked against you. Hey, Brock and Elliot, thanks for taking the time to sit down and have a conversation with us today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Hey, before we kick it in and we actually talk about all the things that we'd ask you guys to share today, I was wondering if you could give us just an update. Could you share currently what's going on? grad school and some passion projects, whatever you got. Brock, you first. Wait, he's the older brother, so. (laughs) Well, I am back home in Wauseon, Ohio, and I am currently running our two family businesses, Weber Sand and Gravel and Paul Ready Mix, and I'm loving that. I just started about a, just over a year ago, I started my MBA at Michigan and really wanted to bring my story full circle. And after having uh, Elliot go there. I got my undergrad at Ohio State or the Ohio State University as they call it around here. And and people always just assume like, wow, you graduated from Michigan. That's such an honor. And I just kind of, and so I was Ohio State and they're kind of, oh, that's, I mean, that's, you know, good too. <laughs> but <laughs> so I thought, let's bring that that full circle. And, and, and it has been unbelievable. It's been a huge challenge because I'm, I'm trying to keep up my full-time job uh, while doing that. And then of course, COVID has put a whole new spin on that. And, uh, now it's all virtual. We had been usually once a month going up to Ann Arbor for classes and, uh, it's been amazing. I've, I've really enjoyed that. And other than that, I've really been trying to push myself getting back into workouts and, and making time for that as I still have, uh, you know, some difficulty, some difficulties walking, but uh, but it's been uh, it's been overall a good year, all things considered for me. That's great. How about you, Elliot? Um, for me right now, I'm actually I'm living in Los Angeles, California. So I've been uh, pursuing a career in acting. Um, I focus mostly on commercials and I'm trying to uh, before the pandemic hit, uh, I was really trying to get into TV and film. Um, so it's. It's a, a grind from my days of playing football at Michigan. It's uh, it's actually very, very similar to kind of going back to square one and deciding I'm going to try to, you know, see if I have some talent at this thing and see if I can learn a new thing other than football and uh, uh, get back into like the, the mindset of just grinding again and being in a competitive field. So, but it's, it's been really good and uh, had a lot of fun doing it. Well, it sounds like both of you guys are busy, but the thing that I – Hope the entire team will get to see the or hear or listen through this entire episode. We'll, we'll realize how close you guys are, both when you grew up and then still today. And uh, you know the other guy that's on here that's co-hosting with me, old Nick Ondasvic, and he was sharing with me that you guys recently had some opportunity to share a little time together and go out to Vegas. Is that true? <laughs> Yes, yes, that is true. That's I, I've been known to visit there from time to time. <laughs> now again, I'm just following the older brother again here <laughs> to Vegas. I get the invite, and uh, you know, but no, yeah, we we like to we like to do uh, we like to go to Vegas a little bit and do a little gambling. Brock uh, maybe more than me, but uh, it's uh, it's always a good time, and especially in, in times like this, you know, you got to get out and have a little fun if you can. 
So, uh, so it was nice. That's great that you both still find the time to share some time with the, with each other and kind of make the effort to a, a good trip or so having the relationship, you know, with your siblings is pretty important. I know Nick's got a chance to see his brother, you know, a couple of times over these long weekends, but, uh, if you guys could, could you share a, a story about the recent trip in Vegas? <laughs> Are we allowed to do that? I don't know. If <laughs> <laughs> no, I, well, I, I will say I, uh, um, really obviously and enjoyed the time we had, but boy, I mean, we, the, the night before we left, um, uh, we just played some slots, which I don't think Elliot's is, you know, I, I just enjoy taking, uh, a little bit of money, just playing a few slots here and there and just, you know, seeing what happens. But I mean, we, the, uh, last night I was there, uh, gosh, I don't even know when we finished. It's probably two or three in the morning, but like we just, but we just had an awesome time and just, and I think we, we all ended up up, but we, uh, but we just, um, I don't know. It was just a, a really good time of, of waiting for those moments of hitting something. And, and, uh, and for us or for me, I had, I had decided to go like three days prior because it was my birthday on a Monday. And then on like Tuesday or Wednesday, my buddy and I said, Hey, why don't we, why don't we just get out of Dodge and just, and just go stay in a hotel and, and, uh, and it was, it was great just to get, you know, just get out of, <laughs> well, for me, getting out of home and you know, lost on for a little bit, you know, it's a nice break, but. Oh, yeah. What he's trying to tell you is we hit a little heater on our last few hours. <laughs> <laughs> Being modest about it. So, yeah, over the course of three, four days, you know, we had a little up, little down, little up, little down, and we got to our last little, uh little run there before we had to catch flights in the morning and uh brock and uh my buddy steve watson was there with me and uh who was a teammate of mine in michigan and then uh myself we said let's uh let's pull together our money here and try to see if we can't make a run and we just kind of played the slots where we're like let's try this one and we hit all right let's get out what about this slot over here and we just we had enough where we got ourselves right uh before we got out of vegas we we hit our little heater and made some money and got out of there. That's awesome. I always tell my son that life's going to give you one of two things, great story or great experience. So if you've made even, or at least have made a little bit, maybe that's both. Yes, absolutely. You're, you're spot on there. <laughs> well, it's great. So for the team that may not familiar with both of you guys, who are the Miele brothers and how would you guys describe, describe each other and really describe the relationship that you guys have? I think, uh, yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm the youngest. And so, um, we actually have an older brother older than both of us, uh, Blake. And so, yeah, the three of us grew up, it was just three boys. And, uh, I can imagine a lot of action movies and a lot of sports in our lives and, uh, growing up playing football and, and everything. So we've always had, uh, I think we've always had, you know, a really close bond and, um, you know, from my perspective, both of my brothers, um, my whole life, you know, just any, anybody that's got an older sibling really kind of look up to them and, uh, want to be like them. And, uh, you kind of, and you all kind of push each other to who's stronger, who can throw the football better, that kind of stuff. And it kind of creates, I think that competition creates the best out of you, whether it's academics, sports, really just an arm wrestle, what, you name it. <laughs> so he's trying to beat my older brothers, Blake and Brock. And, uh, you know, I think ultimately that's brought the best out of me and, and, and brought the best out of each other. And, and clearly you know, taught you a lot about football. For me, so. <laughs> <laughs> clearly, but no, <laughs> that gets passed over sometimes. No. <laughs> Actually my first, uh, my first time playing in full pads in football, I got my thumb stuck in someone's face mask, and the coach had said that had never happened before. <laughs> I was like, eh, I don't know, football's my thing. But uh, but I agree, we've we we really have a, a great relationship, and I am always amazed that, uh, like you said, we've kept a really great connection, even though we've spread out. And whether I go down to Columbus, where my older brother is actually living down in uh, uh, Granville outside of Columbus, but, uh, or if I go to LA and, and just meet, if I see their friends, 
they I just get such a kick out of them laughing because they're like, God, are you, you guys aren't like triplets or twins or something? Because the the mannerisms and a lot of the stuff that we picked up from our dad has has carried through with us and we um but it it is uh really special, you know, and something I think that our dad always told us is when even even when you have these sibling rivalries and you're battling in sports and things like that, he's like you guys don't get it yet, but when you're older, like you guys are going to be best friends all the time. And, and it's pretty cool to see that come together. That's pretty awesome. You guys have mentioned a little bit about the importance of football. So I was wondering if you could share with the team how important football was growing up in your household. And then for Brock, if you could share, when did you realize Elliot was no longer the little brother? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I will say, uh, you know, for me growing up, we, we actually grew up in a, a really small town in Ohio that didn't have football. So uh, Brock and Blake being, uh, you know, a handful of years older than me, they kind of were already in high school. I was still in elementary school. They didn't really get a fair shot at football. And then we moved to a school that had football. But I mean, uh, so I started playing football in fifth grade. Brock played a year of his sophomore year of high school, I think, and our oldest brother, Blake, never really got to. But we're all, you know, six four, six five guys, athletic. And so, uh, you know, I think uh, Brock and Blake kind of missed out there. But I was able to kind of slide in and get used to it in fifth grade and work our way up. But, you know, we had we'd grown up playing backyard football. And, you know, it'd be me and my dad versus Brock and Blake drawing it, just like a lot of people drawing up plays in the sand and that kind of thing. So, it had always been in our our blood, and uh, and you know even taking it to the next level, uh, we grew up diehard Ohio State fans. If you grow up in Ohio, most likely you're going to be an Ohio State fan, and it's not just a fan; it's um, one of the very few things you have growing up in Ohio. You're looking forward to Ohio State football, and so that was kind of bred into us at an early age. And uh, things have a funny way of working out, but it was. Uh, kind of the the fuel that that uh, drove my passion at least to want to play football and want to be a part of something uh like a great team like that and uh you know i'll let, I'll let brock answer his question of when uh, the, the you know the, the answer other no. <laughs> <laughs> i think uh, i i think it was around the time that we had moved growing up which elliot would have been in uh he was in f- f- well fifth grade but it would have been fourth fifth grade for elliot and i was I would have been a freshman or sophomore in high school. And we used to, depending on, uh, you know, which brothers were, were actually home and not doing some of that, some extracurricular, uh, a lot of times my dad would quarterback and then we would switch offense, defense, and wide receiver, and one would be DB. And, and around that time, I kind of realized I couldn't really push him around like I had <laughs> prior to that. And I also remember trying, when he played in, uh, in fifth grade, when he was playing, uh, that's when he got his start really playing football. I remember as a sophomore in high school, just saying, just let me play one game. I'll put your helmet on. No one will even know. And I'll have some fun with it. Cause it really was like having a high schooler with these fifth graders and they're jumping on his back and he's just running the ball. I'm like, that just looks like fun to me. And you know, little did I know, I still get asked so many technical questions about football and I have, no clue and and i and it's so funny to me listening to people yell at sports like why didn't you do this or why not run this play and 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 i just kind of shake my head because i'm like they have no clue what plays they run or what defense they're in or any of those technical things that you know elliot's learned and i i can't even play him in like madden or ncaa anymore because he's like why would you run that defense against this spread off like i'm like i don't know like whatever you know but uh but no it was i i even as a high schooler he was in elementary school still uh you know it's like oh, okay like he's he's passing me but the nice thing was is you no longer go to thanksgiving and and have you know your aunts and uncles say oh who's taller here they <laughs> would go over to my older brother blake oh look who's who's taller blake and i just you know sit back and say yeah like that's good <laughs> <laughs> not to be fair to be fair brock Last time I was home, this is the this is the older brother move here, but we did pull out the Sega Genesis. Brock threw on, I think it's Joe Montana ninety four or something. Yeah. Just kicked my butt to the point where I was like, you know what? <laughs> Never beat you in it. Still can't beat you in it. Forget that game. Okay, that's one football game. <laughs> Still got the upper hand in some areas. <laughs> that's awesome. 
I, I can see the comparisons. I've got uh, two brothers, and you know, there's a big age difference for us as well. So my my younger brother, who's the second out of the five of us, he's about two and a half years younger. And then the uh, my next youngest brother, he's number four out of the five of us. But all three of us and are serving in the military. I mean, we went through uh, West Point to get there, but there's a big difference. And so, you know, when we come back together, the same kind of passion that you're talking about with football, when we all come back together, we're all sharing, you know, different experiences. But at the same time, we're all making fun of each other, you know, different things. And so I, I always tell them, right, you know, like I'm the original, you know, my brother's a Xerox and the youngest one's like the Xerox of the Xerox, like in multiplicity. But I am the oldest and I am not the tallest. So I can empathize with Blake. <laughs> That's too funny because Multiplicity is one of our favorite movies. So we uh, it's a go to. Yeah, Rock, Rock really likes that. I get to be the the, the copy of the copy here. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, Brock, you mentioned uh, your parents, and I was wondering if you could share, you know, about about mom and dad and what you guys learned. So you talked a little bit about this rivalry, and I don't think people who have, are familiar with the E60 or your story about how significant, you know, Ohio State and Michigan rivalry was, but really what did mom and dad teach both of you or all three of you guys while you were growing up? Yeah, they, I mean, I will say they they definitely pushed us. I mean, my mom was uh, just always – encouraging encouraging us in all types of things of course she wasn't as passionate about football but was always pushing us in, to do our best in school and in sports and band and all the things that we we had done and um and my dad my dad he, he definitely was focused on on uh football and other sports and and there was nothing quite like uh which i think most people know that like going up against your dad in those sports, you know, and him telling you like, this was my move when I, when I was back in the day, you know, and he'd show you those things. And, um, and, and those are the things to me that, that really carry me through all the hard times. And, and like I said, um, the, my mom has really just been, uh, the rock through all the, all the changes and, and upheaval we've had throughout our life. And she's always been, um, just a, a steady force and like, and keeping us, you know, focused and, and bring us back to, um, you know, solid ground basically. And, uh, and to this day, she's just been, um, you know, been that way for us. So. It sounds like a lot of compassion, but your dad kind of driving that competitiveness a little bit in you. Absolutely. And, and I, I did always, uh, love those moments cause I, with my, even with my dad that, uh, you know, he, he really put together some great words of wisdom uh, in my life in those in those tough moments that I I had growing up and and uh, and I always I do I go back to those moments a lot of times now uh, when I'm having a bad bad time and and even this year with the crazy things that have happened that I a lot of times go back to that and it really does drive me to you know get to that next day and and keep myself driving, you know, and especially with, uh, doing my MBA and the time crunch it is. Um, we, we growing up a lot of times, uh, especially Blake and I would, would push him to go to the golf course after work. And now I kind of realize the days that he may not be all about golf <laughs> after work. I realized why well, that might be, he just like, just cool down and chill on the couch for a minute. And, uh, and I always, yeah, just, uh, I don't know. It's, it's good, good memories. Yeah. You know, there's, there's one thing uh, that uh, I remember growing up, you know, with my dad, it was the same thing. You know, I think every son that grows up, you know, that loves to compete in sports against their dad, it's their goal, right. To try to get some point to either get to his level or to beat him. And so for, for me growing up, it was always playing one-on-one -on -one basketball. And so the first time that I ended up beating him, is when he came back from this long field problem and he was in the military. And so he came back after 30 days and I saw him in his uniform and I was like, let's go, old man, I'm ready to do this. And that, that was the first time I beat him. So my dad could probably also empathize with uh, why basketball was not on his mind when he was coming back and had been and sleeping in his own bed or eating a hot meal for the 30 days. But I appreciate you sharing that. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Elliot? 
Uh, well, that was a good game plan on your part. <laughs> you got you to attack the opponents a little weaker. So that's, uh, but no, it's funny. It's funny you say that. I'm actually uh, a book I'm reading right now called Wild at Heart uh, talks about that specifically. The how you know, as a young boy growing up, you do try to you try to compete more and more with your father. And really, at the end of the day, it's about getting his approval of like, you've got what it takes, you know, whether that's basketball, whether it's life, it's you're always kind of secretly trying to, uh, to get that approval from your father. And I think Brock, like Brock said, and, and like you just shared too, you know, um, we had plenty of experiences to, to get that approval from our dad, be- beating them. And, you know, basketball was our dad's game too. So a lot of times it used to turn into, uh, you know, all right, we'll go uptown and get a milkshake and a, a triple cheeseburger if you if you can beat me in a quick game to eleven. You know, and he'd get up to a six zero start. You know, and now you're really pissed because he's embarrassing you about it. You don't get to <laughs> like, you know. So, but you know, and then you bat it lets you battle back a little bit. And those moments right there, like Brock said, are what we cherish. I mean, playing backyard football for us to to, to take it a step further and how serious it was. We'd wake up on Saturday mornings and our dad. Uh, who worked for the state. So he had all these little fancy equipment. He'd have one of those walking sticks with the spray paint in it. And he'd be out there Saturday morning, spray painting a little mini football field in the backyard. I mean, he'd be serious. That's awesome. Kick- kickoffs at this time, get your, you know, eat your Wheaties, watch some cartoons. And then it's game time here, <laughs> you know, and it was serious to us. It's like, all right, here we go. You know? So, but Brock, you know, as Brock said, like our dad was very good. I think at, Making us competitive, making us enjoy sports, uh, you know, may, helping us understand kind of what it took to, you know, like Brock said, he gave us a lot of wisdom on, you know, what it took to be better, to, to, to keep improving, you know, no pain, no gain, all those little sayings he was a big fan of, but it really does stick with you. And I think our mom, like he said, especially, you know, in the last 10 years has always been a, a, a steady, stable rock for us. And she's, for me, she's always the, uh, she's kind of the purpose or the, uh, the reason I have the mentality of kind of chasing your dreams and, and anything is possible and you, you know, you can accomplish anything. She's very, uh, positive and speaking things into uh, reality. And so, uh, for her or for us, you know, it was a really great combination of, uh, we were very fortunate to have two parents that kind of, uh, balanced each other out in a way of, uh, really making us strive to be our best in life. So, very fortunate. It just made me remember back uh, in terms of basketball, we had an old barn with a hay mound in it where it was just old wood boards all laid across beams. And our dad actually built a plywood floor up there, put two basketball hoops at either end, which you didn't have enough room on the sides to get the three point line all the way, but you, the three point lines didn't touch, you know, half court. So it was just enough to have a three point line that went out that way. But I mean, I remember him building that and, and that's, that's when basketball really got serious, just like the football lines. And it was like, we're going up the hay mound. Like if you want warm ups, you got to start at this time. Cause then we're going to start like, then we have games of regulation hoops, like actual glass backboards and like, you know, sealed into the walls and like breakaway rims like it was the real deal it was not yeah and we i mean you'd have i mean you'd go up there for i mean the whole day but you'd have games of horse and and around the world whatever what you play everything you can imagine you know build up to a game or three on three and it was yeah it was great times every everything was a competition i think for uh for dad you know and it was all in good fun but i mean we'd be a you know, wedding receptions and it would be like tic-tac-toe would start getting drawn onto the tablecloth. Like, all right, boys, like who, you know, who wants it? Who wants it? We got a dollar a game, you know, like that kind of So it's always, always trying to prove your uh, worth to your uncles and your dad and brothers and every cousins. I mean, it was kind of how we were raised. And I was, I was just thinking of that. My dad, we used to go to his flag football games when, I mean, God, I think Elliot probably was like, five and I was probably like nine at that time uh back in the 90s and uh and I was talking to one of my dad's buddies and he said they had like they played like five seasons of flag football and it it was my dad um and one of his brothers and then two of his nephews that are older than Ellie and I and then uh, and then their buddies but anyway they never lost a game in five seasons 
And I'm like, are you you're serious? He's like, yeah. And he's like, and nobody liked us because we would, we'd win every flag football game, but he's, and, and I remember it being serious. You know, he, he put the black <laughs> eye on him. And, 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 Never played, played high, never played high school football. None of these guys have ever even had high school football. When we yeah. grew up. None of them played no. football in high school or junior. Didn't even have the option to flag football. Uh, it was that serious. <laughs> so, yeah. I was like, you never lost it. Never, not a, a game. Yeah. I still got to get those VHS tapes from him and watch that. <laughs> the game. Classic. That's awesome. You know, I, I remember just like you guys were sharing, even my own parents, they would always teach you these lessons, right? It's about work ethic and the values. My daddy used to always tell me, it's like, I'm not going to leave you any riches, but when I leave you, it's going to be a good set of values and a work ethic. You take that and you can apply it to anywhere. Very similar to what you guys were talking about. And and anybody that's listening that has that that same type of experience where you have sibling rivalry and you and you're going through and you're and you're and you're listening to the competition that's going through uh, for all these like Thanksgiving or you're getting togethers and, and you carry that in you know you carry that on in adulthood it's, it's some aspect of it right if if you guys would see how we are with my brothers during fantasy football I mean. Uh, our our spouses is like like lose their mind. We're like seriously, you know, this is like Dungeons and Dragons. Like, look at yourselves, you know, and they're making fun of us. So I appreciate you guys sharing that. <laughs> Serious business. Well, you know, when you guys both talked about what your mom and dad both shared, I, I was wondering what what message would you leave with our team for those you know that may not have their parents or only have one parents. What message would you leave with them? And what message would you leave with them, you know, if they're going through a rocky relationship about the importance of having that relationship of what your, your mom and dad could pass down to you? Well, I can start and I would say uh, I've had, especially these last 10 years following the tragic accident we were in, I've had a tremendous amount of gratitude and I found that the people that I really connect with, they all have heard, well, a lot of them have heard the story I've had with Mike Barwis and others, of course, uh, know, know a little bit from ESPN or the Big Ted Network about the relationship I had with my dad and, and my mom. And just, uh, they usually are able to share that person for them, even if it's not a parent. And especially, like I said, with Mike, they, they're able to find whether it's his coach or whether it's his teacher they have that has given them direction in their life and has pushed them. That is, I guess, what I would tell someone, you know, to really look at and focus on, because I think in the busyness of life, there's times where we, we miss that. We know that person's there, but we don't really recognize it and, and share that with them. And I, I always encourage at my, uh, which sadly I haven't been able to go out and, and talk to groups like I do, but uh, that's one of the the points I always try to reach on is is that, that even in in whatever season of life that person's in it is for them to find who that person is right now. And maybe maybe your parents live far away, and you've connected with uh, you know a boss or 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 uh, you know just a friend, but like to connect with that person and really share that gratitude that you have, like you've had this impact on my life and, and, and make sure they know about it because that has, uh, especially with Mike and, and having those conversations over a long period of time of, of training with them, that has pushed me not to, you know, cause I don't want to let him down, even though I know I could never, I could never disappoint him. It, it drives me so much not to let Mike down. And after you guys have talked to him and you probably don't want to disappoint him either. And, uh, and, and I always encourage people to, you know, to really share gratitude with that person that's had an impact on your life and, and take the time to spend more time with that person, because you certainly realize how, how much it's impacted you. That's a great message. How about you, Elliot? Yeah, I would agree. Uh, I would, I would totally agree. You know, Mike doesn't really give you an option to, uh, (laughs) disappoint us. So, uh, and I know about that too, but, uh, which is which is good, but um, what was the what was the original question there? I was just asking a message that you would leave to those 
that uh, may not have their parents or still have their parents or are going through a, a, a rocky relationship, what would you offer to them? Um, yeah, you know, Brock expressed gratitude. I think the biggest, one of the bigger things that I've learned is kind of who you're surrounded with, which is very similar to what he's saying. I've, I've learned the importance of, uh, you know, having relationships, obviously through the bad experiences we've had, the, the tragedy we lived through, you realize the, the people around you. And sometimes it's people you don't even expect that come out and they offer support. And, and I've always remembered certain people where I'm like, well, I didn't think that person was really, you know, liked me or wasn't a friend or they were pretty distant and that, and then they're reaching out and, and kind of trying to lift you up. And, um, you know, so I've realized the importance of that, even in the good times, it's good to have good people around you in life. Uh, people that do push you like a Mike Barwis, um, you know, and people that are there for you and, and support you and, uh, and then and vice versa when you're surrounded with good people, uh, I think that's really when you are able to excel and life's unfortunate tragedies that you can't really predict. Um, it makes it even more important to have those people around you and, and to have good, good relationships uh, to lean on uh, when those bad times do happen. I think you both are, are sharing some very important messages. You know, we've had some guests before that have talked about your network is really your net worth. And I share with my son, you know, never let yourself be surrounded by joy thieves because, you know, life is too short. And, and as we move to having the discussion about, you know, the, the, uh, the tragic events that you both had gone through, um, I, I, think it's, I think it's very important for those that are going through some very, very difficult times and a lot of times realize, you know, who is really there as their network is very important that can help them. Um, and so you guys have talked about your parents. You've talked about Mike Barwis. So a lot of times I, I've heard leaders talk about the importance of establishing this network. It could be a coach, it could be a parents, it could be a teacher. And, and the more resources to establish this network is going to help you through some of those life challenges and potentially crucibles that you're going to end up facing. And then the last thing I would share, I mean, you guys gave the message the best, but just to reiterate it and kind of share with our team in another way, I've heard a coach talk about live the now well, that a lot of times we're so focused, you know, and all the things that we're looking about, about worried about what the future and worried about what's going on in the past. And, and I read that the science will tell us that we end up having about 60,000 thoughts a day. If you're on Dasavik, you probably have like 100,000. <laughs> but 85% of those thoughts end up being negative. So, you know, and, and the next day, what they'll say is 95% of what you're thinking about the next day is just repetitive from the day before. So I think both your message that you're talking about, one that you're sharing about parents, but just really about the importance of relationships and living the now well. Yeah, I, 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 I totally, uh, I totally agree with you. I'm, I'm a, I'm a big believer. I don't know how much it's changed in the last 10 years, but I feel like it, it, it's always growing and, uh, trying to kind of keep the good times rolling. Let's have fun while we can. Let's be happy while we can. Uh, it doesn't mean there's not going to be problems that need to be addressed. And, and, you know, obviously, unfortunately, bad, some bad things happen, but sometimes, you know, small, small bad things happen and you can make them bigger and uh, it's not necessary. So I think it's certainly helped me have more of uh, the perspective you're talking about and trying to uh, shut off the negative voices in your head or negative people that come into your life trying to keep everything cool. It's, life is short and, uh, you know, let's try to be happy and, 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 and have as many good times as we can. I think that... Uh you know, as we transition and, and I asked you guys to share about, you know, a lot of people will talk about what a crucible moment is and it could be life changing. It changes potentially the relationships, how you look at things. And very rarely will you end up having individuals having that same experience. It really ends up being a crucible for, for both of them. So I was wondering, you know, as we talk through and, and some have heard your story, but for those that haven't, you know, we go back to that, that moment what is it that, and how would you like to share, you know, the events that led up 
as you guys were uh, facing what was a truly a crucible moment for both of you Christmas Eve. You want to take that one, Brock, or I want? Yeah, I can. I, uh, uh, yeah, just uh, the night of the accident, we were at a family get together um, and, and doing what most families do, you know, just uh, <laughs> having a party and, and hanging out. And I, I yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those things, like you said, with this crucible moment thing there's so many details that are crystal clear in my mind, but there's also a lot of moments that are just missing, you know, and blank. But, uh, but I do remember the accident happening and a man ran a stop sign. We were five minutes from home. And, and when, when it happened, I, I, uh, I instantly just blacked out. And, and when I came to, I, I didn't think I really came to, I thought I had felt fallen asleep and, and was still asleep. And, and I don't even know how much time had passed, but I, I do remember being trapped in the car for a lot. Well, in my mind, a, a long period of time, but, uh, being transported to our local, uh, uh county hospital and, and still really not realize what had happened. I remember, uh, I remember a trooper coming in and, and sharing the tragic news with me of, of what had actually transpired in the accident and, and really just being in these moments of shock after shock. Uh, I was, I think around midnight, maybe 1 a.m. Christmas morning, I was at the Toledo hospital and I was transferred there by ambulance. And after getting the initial x-rays, they knew I had to have surgery. I didn't know any of that, but, uh, but I went into surgery uh, for eight and a half hours and didn't, didn't wake up until the next morning, uh, which would have been 10 or 11 Christmas morning and, and had the doctor tell me that it was likely I would never walk again, that it was one of the worst accident or worst injuries she had ever seen. And, and I still, it, it didn't really process with me other than I was still in this nightmare of, of a moment and, uh, and, and quite literally thinking I am still asleep. Uh, I think that what I remember was that the surgery lasted about five seconds when I did the countdown. I mean, the surgery was over before I hit from 10 to zero. And, but I still really literally thought I was in a nightmare. I think this went on for about two weeks, especially while I was still at the uh, Toledo hospital, uh, St. V's. I thought, I thought that two weeks, it was, was literally this long extended nightmare and I was going to wake up from it. And uh, when I got to the University of Michigan to do physical therapy, uh, that's I think the first time I, it really, really started to hit me that that there was no waking up from this. Like this was my this was my reality now, and I had no really. And I guess the fortunate part for me, I, I had nothing to com even come close to comparing to to that night and and everything that had transpired, uh, and it and it was. It was uh, something that, you know, you talk about, you know, living in the, in the now. And, and for me, there really wasn't a now outside of, of pain and anguish. And, and it was a really difficult time to even process that it was real and, and, and understand that it actually was real. It was a, uh, yeah, just, just uh, <laughs> tragic Elliot, can you share with everybody and kind of set the scene that may not be familiar who, who was in the vehicle? And then obviously there was another individual that was driving about 90 miles an hour and then ended up hitting your vehicle. Uh, yeah. So as Brock said, we, uh, we were at a family gathering at our cousin's uh, a Christmas Eve party that we you know, had done for as long as I could remember being alive. We had a Christmas Eve party with all our cousins and kind of your, your, you know, 
bigger, bigger family, aunts, uncles, cousins, the cousins you don't even, uh, you know, a lot of times don't see all the time. And, uh, but, um, you know, we, we had headed home to go to a, uh, really to go to a midnight candle service, uh, for, with our other family on Christmas Eve. And, uh, so as my dad was driving, uh, Brock was in the front seat. Um, my mom who was in the back seat behind my dad and then myself, uh, I was in the middle and my, my girlfriend at the time, Hollis Reeker was, uh, on the outside and she had gotten sick that night. So we were headed, kind of headed home to, to get her home. And, uh, you know, uh, yeah, and, uh, I think he was 92 year old man, ran a stop sign, uh, pra- practically blind, can't, couldn't see, shouldn't have been driving. Uh, ran a stop sign and hit us and, uh, the car rolled, um, uh, in the accident. Um, you know, my father, uh, lost his life. My girlfriend Hollis lost her life. Uh, uh my mom, I believe that she had a, a hip injury. I tore my rotator cuff and, uh, Brock had, uh, uh, injured his spinal cord. Um, so yeah, it was a, uh, very, um, Kind of like Brock said, um, you know, although I can't speak on his perspective, but it was very much uh, a nightmare trying to figure out what, you know, what it's, you really can't put it into words trying to figure out what's reality and is this happening? And then it, it all happens so quickly. You're trying to, um, you know, save people you can't save or trying to absorb the information. And, um, I mean, it was just, you know, your, your life kind of gets flipped upside down from that point, not only from a, a physical aspect, but also to a mental aspect. And it kind of, as we've already talked, it does give you a different perspective. Although I've, you know, it, it's constantly evolving, constantly trying to understand why things like that happen. Um, but ultimately it gives you a different perspective on life. Uh, and really like you, like we've talked about already really enjoying the moments that you can, um, because bad things do happen like this. And obviously you try to avoid things at this level of tragedy, but, um, you know, I think, I think for us, it's, it's given us, you know, our, our, once we got through kind of a, an initial period, and like I said, it's continuing to evolve. You really, to, to me at least, you never really get over these things. You just learn to live with them. And, and because of that, just like we're talking, uh, you know, about resilience, um, you're, you're kind of thrust upon you to, to build that toughness and to build that strength. And, and the way we've looked at it, quite honestly, and just like doing this right now, sharing our stories, it's, it's not fun to share but at the same time, it does help people. I mean, we've had so many people that have heard the story through podcasts, through like Brock said, ESPN and Big Ten Network. Uh, my point being is that we've tried to take this tragedy and turn it into some sort of, I guess, uh, you know, motivation for other people. Because because unfortunately, there's people that have worse stories than ours that you can't even hardly comprehend. And, and other people that are just going through you know, maybe a bad breakup or something. It's, it's all about perspective. And if our story can try to encourage people and try to help people that, Hey, things do get better. Um, you can't overcome. And, um, you know, that, that, that's rewarding for us because as it is, the tragedy we went through is a tragedy and, and it will always be a tragedy. But if there's some way you can try to bring good from it, try to help, try to inspire, um, not only does it help other people, but I, quite honestly, it's rewarding for me to hear someone come up to me and say, I heard, I heard your story. I saw, I lost someone in my life that really gave me encouragement and so on and so forth. You hear a lot of stories like that. And honestly, that's the best, th- that's the really the best outcome from what happened. That's the best thing for me is to hear people that are encouraged by it um, because it, it lifts me up too to know other people are uh, having their own stories, having their own challenges and overcoming them and really brings you together and, and uh, you know, helps try to turn a bad thing into a, a somewhat positive thing if you can. Well, I appreciate both of you guys sharing. And I know that hey, as you go through and, and for those that are going through their own tragedy or their own crucible and they're, and they're listening to you share your story, how do you start? 
How do you start? I mean, you, you talked about some great things that you learned from your mom and dad and these life lessons that I know you both end up dealing with today. Both of you talked about this great network, family, friends, and then, you know, Brock, you're going through all this news and Elliot, you're going through, you know, similarly the same thing for Brock, but the loss of your girlfriend, both of you, the loss of your dad, for both of you, what, what message would you share with the team about where do you even start? I think for, for me, um, and uh, kind of, to I guess, take something from, uh, this has always stuck with me, to take something from the military. When I was at Michigan my senior year, our coach took us to train with uh, the Navy SEALs for about four hours. And uh, Was it a daycare? What's the- <laughs> well, I'll tell you this, I don't care to ever do it again. So <laughs> I expect that of a Michigan grad. <laughs> It was only four hours, but one thing I did take away from uh, kind of the classroom part of it uh, was that they spoke about, um, you know, just one step at a time. And, 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 you know, you have so much on your table, so many things you can think about. And when I heard that and I kind of looked back at my own experiences, I felt like that is really the only way I could do it is to focus at the thing at hand, focus at the thing, uh, the very next thing you have to take care of, not so much looking at the uh, the whole picture of things, and which is an easy way to, to really simplify it. But uh, at the end of the day, when I look back at it, for what helped me the most uh, was really my faith in God and, and feeling that I would be able to see them again, ultimately, and also the people that were around me. And, um, you know, some of these people I, I, I don't even necessarily keep in touch with, but in our hometown, we had so many great people around us, lifting us up. And like I said, people that I didn't even really totally know or think care reached out and, and lifted us up. And I think that was the importance. Um, when I look back as being surrounded by so many great people, you know, at the time of the accident, I was committed to Michigan. I was uh, in my senior year of high school. So I knew I was going to Michigan, but I didn't really know you know, Rich Rodriguez had just taken over. Um, I didn't even know it. I hadn't met any of the staff or anything like that. And to know I was going to Michigan and who could have guessed that Mike Barwis would be at Michigan, a guy who likes challenges, saw Brock and said, I don't know exactly what you're going through, but I do know the human body. If you want to, if you want to work at, at walking again, I, I want to try to to help you get there. And well, I mean, that's a nice way of putting it. No. Yeah. <laughs> you be a lazy ass? Are you going to do this? <laughs> but when I look back, I, I'm, I'm very fortunate. Like Brock said earlier, gratitude. I am very fortunate to, to have been surrounded by so many great people, uh, many of which were at Michigan and in our community of Wauseon back home and in the surrounding communities. It really makes me thankful and appreciate even now being surrounded by good people, being surrounded by positive people, um, and people that want to see you do your best. And then when those bad times do happen, they're, they're going to be there for you even more. So, um, and I'm thankful for that. So. Well, I think what you're, uh, sharing, you know, is that beginning of your own personal resiliency and grit because many, many, as you had highlighted, you know, you go through this tragedy, you lose a parent, you lose your girlfriend, you see your brother, he's paralyzed. And then you're still having to make that decision to go to college, you know, and a lot of times, you know, it's very easy for, for people to look at that and say, you know, I know what my family's going through. College is not the right thing. So what was your family saying, knowing all this was going on and you're still having to go into, you know, your freshman year? You know, I think it was, uh, I, I always tell people, um, because one of the things that it really did to me, especially initially, was it did make football seem kind of pointless. I was kind of like, what, you know, what am I doing playing this sport here? And, and, and no less Mike Barwis, you know, it, it was not fun. <laughs> the training, you know, is so miserable. And I'm thinking in my head, like, this is, you know, this is pointless when I've got Brock, you know, he's going through what he's going through. And, and uh, I really just wanted to be with my family and kind of crawl into it 
crawl into the house and never leave again. But the reality was, is, is what I always say is that football did save me. Going to college did save me. Um, again, being around positive people, being around uh, people that have a common goal, which, you know, our game to win, uh, you know, our goal of winning football games seemed so trivial, trivial at the time. But it really did save me. And it, it kind of took me a couple of years to realize that of college. It's kind of, uh, you know, it was a struggle. But, but my teammates, again, uh, to be, you know, even more specific, my teammates, once I got to Michigan, that was my community. And these were guys that didn't have the perspective quite that I had um, of kind of this doom and gloom thing. They kind of lifted me up. They brought me out of it. And, um, again, that was a part of uh, – that was a part of the community I had that I was so thankful for. They were saving me. I don't think they knew it and I didn't know it at the time, but really football was saving me and being around these teammates um, helped me get kind of regain my perspective on life that even though bad things do happen, it doesn't have to uh, totally destroy all your goals and, and dreams. Um, you can still have those and, 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 and still strive to uh, accomplish great things. I appreciate that. How about you, Brock? How do you start after going through what you went through? Hey, well, I, I have been, I've, I've felt bl my, mainly blessed, but somewhat cursed. I, I, I connect with people so often because I hate to hear uh, tragic stories. And, and uh, one thing is I, I never try to minimize. I, I'm always disappointed to hear that you know or someone say like well what i've gone through isn't anything near as bad as yours because what well, i think elliot said that earlier is people face these things that are just crushing events and in their mind they're absolutely real they're they are terribly tragic and they're a struggle and and whatever that challenge is but that's i, I get to connect with people and, and as i said earlier about gratitude is i love to hear that person's Mike Barwis of their life that is carrying them because you can see it in their eyes. They light up and they're like, you know, this person helped, you know, and this person did this for me. And I'm like, that's amazing. You know, and I really empathize with all the people that I, that I connect with. And but yeah, where do you start? I mean, for me, uh, it does, it, it went back to faith constantly. It went back to faith for me. And, and along with that, I, I felt, especially in the beginning, that I was on borrowed time. And again, that kind of goes back to that gratitude that, uh, well, just that I was given this this second chance that, that I easily could have gone without, you know, to be alive, you know, and, and it's it's a, a real blessing every day to get up and, and be able to take on life and, you know, and like you said, live in the now and, and embrace it. And I, I just always like trying to bring that out of someone that I connect with. Like, what is your, what is driving you? Because at times, just like that, that person that you may not take the time to thank, it's like that, that really what's in your laid in your heart. Sometimes you have to bring that out and say like, that's your thing. And, you know, and I, and I love connecting with someone, but then when we part ways kind of feeling like one, they lifted me up. Like Elliot said, I feel like it lifts me up so much, but, but getting to see them, you know, walk away from that and, and, and just kind of hold their, you know, head up a little higher and feel a little bit and like, like that, that person's got it, you know, and I think we all need to just be reminded of that. And, and likewise with what Elliot said is surrounding a lot of times, I, I think people don't even realize the negative, the negativity that's, that's all around them. And in, in our situation, it was, you know, it, well, I had a choice. I could have said no to Mike or, or said yes. And, and so many times I have people say, man, I would love to work out with Michigan players. And I said, no, you wouldn't. And, I, and I'm sure like you might get the same thing. Like, oh man, I'd love to do that. It's like, no, you wouldn't. Like maybe, maybe a little bit of the time, but not 99% of the time you're going to hate it. It's going to be miserable. And, uh, but I will say that's really, and I'm sure, uh, <laughs> people can think of, of those moments in their own lives where they really create that bond, because I don't think you get that outside of high school sports. A lot of people don't get that again at their job or at church or another place. You might not ever get quite that bond because you you're going through, you know, in, in your mind, you're going through hell. And in my mind, I literally did go through hell with Mike. 
And uh, I often said they had the uh, the patent quote on the wall that may God have mercy on my um, enemies because I won't. And I said they need to change that to may God have mercy on Brock because Mike won't because <laughs> he never did. But but I felt like I built a, a great bond with with uh, well especially um, you know what was special to me was. Uh, a lot of people in our, our family, like we didn't see Elliot, you know, he's like football 24 seven. And he, he, you know, went all in with that. And I got to see those moments and, you know, we weren't bantering back and forth like we do now, but, but I got to see what workouts he went through. And then I, of course, got to go through those workouts, but in the same way with his teammates, they got to watch me do my workouts. And it was always funny because when they leave their workouts, it would be like, Oh, this is our, whatever the NCAA limited, like, boom, you know, you're done working out for the day. And, mm-hmm. and I'd be like, well, see you guys later. And Mike would just laugh. Like, you're not even on scholarship. Like you're not going anywhere. We have no <laughs> rules. You know, like, you don't have any limits. And, and I mean, there, there were times I felt like the janitors would be like watching us like, Hey, like we're supposed to shut the lights off. And what do you guys, and, it, and, and most of the time it was, Mike would give me a goal and we're not leaving until you do it which it would sometimes be like, so you're going to keep me here for the next like three years or what, you know, I mean, but, but we always did. It was, that was, what was amazing to me is we always, we always, whatever insane goal that I had never done since my injury, like we would, we would get there. And, and what was incredible to me was uh, when we started, I never would have, believe he'd always tell me what it was throughout you know the the morning workout but but i'd never truly believed i would get there but sometimes you do have to uh just just you know try have that trust it it was what i had with mike was just fully trusting that do whatever you want with me and and kind of like elliot said like it was like i don't even care anymore almost to it to the extent like i don't care you know what happens like i just want you do whatever you think i need to because i i wanted to kind of take my hands off the wheel at that point with how i had spent two years in physical therapy which was extremely hard and then mike said well have you have you thought about doing something harder than that i was like well physical therapy is the hardest thing i've ever done in my life well maybe you need to try hard you know and nobody was going to say that to me in my uh, wheelchair but the atmosphere there was complete opposite from the hospital which nothing against it, but nobody wants to be in the hospital. And I always tell the story of this lady that would just shout no repeatedly throughout the entire session of physical therapy. And it really does almost make it impossible to do something. I mean, even like write your name, someone just saying no in your face, you know, and, and, uh, and so challenging. And there, everyone was like, yes, do it. And, and, I love those brief moments. Well, I hated those brief moments, but, but when I'm doing my workout, but when, when the uh, Elliot's teammates would get done with a workout and, and they might start this line and I'm just crawling on a football field and I have this lineup of these players like cheering me on and they get that moment of experiencing what a college athlete experiences going in the stadium, but it was just us, you know? So it was, it was just a, really special moment. And again, those are the, those moments I look back in my life. I think when you look back at your life, it's really easy to see the negative things that happen to you. And if you don't take the time to think of the positives, which like I said, I don't always, I don't really think of, you know, winning a trophy or the award time, but I think of those moments when I was absolutely miserable and these guys, instead of going to their next class or study table, whatever busy thing they had on their schedule, they're watching me crawl on this field trying to just get to the other end, you know. And I'm like, God, people don't, you know, they don't get that. And 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 people want to be a part of the Michigan football or play or like I'd love to do that. Well, they wouldn't love to do that moment, but they want. I mean, you can't you can't you know buy those special moments, you know. And and uh, and that's what I think is so important about living in the now those moments will come and they'll create themselves. But, you, you know, and, and especially in my case, you know, I was crawling down that field. Uh, Mike wouldn't let me bring my wheelchair into the weight room. At one point I would crawl all over the gym and I thought it was just, you know, like just to break me down, that kind of thing. But, uh, but it really did become this mentality where I, I forgot all about the chair during my day because I had so much else going on. And, uh, and it really, it was, it was really just about creating an atmosphere that 
um, wouldn't allow me to fail. It would not accept disappointment or failure, any of those things. And, and, and that's what he did. And I think people need to realize that, that they can choose who influences them. We don't have to just be victims of, of the people around us and say, oh, well, I'm just influenced so much by negativity. I can't do anything about it. You know, you absolutely can. That's a, that's an awesome story. And, and I tell you that, you know, what you're sharing about this relationship with you and Mike is, is what we see and what you would hear from a lot of soldiers when they talk about their team leaders and their squad leaders and, and that, Hey, I'm just surrendering, giving in that's trust. That's this relationship that he's going to change the environment. He's going to push you, continue to make you challenge over comfort and do things that you didn't think because you, we all want to believe that we, we know what our potential is, but it takes somebody else that's going to squeeze it out of us. And a lot of times, you know, you could end up falling, you could end up breaking, but that same individual who's invested in you, as you just mentioned, he's going to pick you back up and he's going to put you through that same stress again and keep him having you move along. Absolutely. And, and so you guys have both mentioned Mike, you know, and so, and, and you mentioned how you would love to hear who the Mike Boris is and somebody and somebody else's stories as they talk through that. And when I got a chance to sit down with him and I was talking through this, you could hear this pride, you know, about all the things he's doing and he's talking about and about how a lot of times it's coming up with a plan. You're working, you're working, you're working, and then something doesn't work. You go back again and you're constantly working this problem. And so you guys are the em embodiment in both your situations about what really Angela Duckworth talks about, what grit is, which is this passion and this per and perseverance for long-term goals. And so when she was talking about, there's really like kind of four stages, right? There's this, you got to trigger this interest, this passion. So for you, Elliot, it was football, you know, and it took somebody to fuel that you know, and keep getting back after that again and get you back on the field to compete, which is the same thing that you grew up, as you told us already, that you love because you learned that from your dad, right? And Brock, for you, is learning to walk again, you know, it was to not rely. And it was, you know, the physical aspect of the chair. But as I'm hearing you, Mike's like, nope, that's not, that's not coming in. That's staying. And he's forcing you to go through this. You both talk about, right, describing this practice, how you would go through and the focus and the reps that you're going through this. And then both of you have talked about finding the purpose. And this really, it's awesome because it's a combined purpose for both of you because you've both talked about, even though that I've gone through this tragedy, we can share this with others to make an impact. I can make a difference. And then the last thing, you know, is for both of you, it's really this hope. It's this growth mindset, you know, about I'll fall seven but get eight, eight times. And Mike talks about that all the time. So you know, now we're on the kind of conversation about this leadership, this coach, this mentor, you know, like Mike Barwis. And a lot of times for both of you, he would give you the love that you didn't necessarily want, but the love you needed. So what would you share about coach Mike Barwis? And then what those that don't even realize, you know, the Mike Barwis's are currently in their life and what they're putting them through. Brock, we'll start with you. <laughs> well, like you, like you said, it, it was uh, not really what I wanted, but it was, it was absolutely what I needed. And, you know, Mike was a guy that uh, I, I, one of my, I mean, I obviously have a million stories with Mike. It's been amazing going and talking because at first I would pray about it. I'm like, God, I, I gotta go talk to this group. Like, what am I even going to say to him? And I'd spend all this time practicing and all that. And now that I've done it hundreds of times, like, I'm like, God, I could do a whole week conference with people and still not get out all these life lessons that I picked up along the way. But one of my favorites uh, that, uh, that I have with Mike is actually being at the hospital. Uh, and I believe, I think Elliot might've been the first player he even met. And of course, learned to, you know, I started to, try to find out a little bit more about him and, and get to know him. And, uh, but he came to the hospital, uh, in February. So it would have been about, uh, two months after the accident. And, and I, a few other Elliot's offensive line coach, I remember the wide receiver coach, Tony Dews came and, and some other assistants and, and, uh, 
but anyway, they all introduce themselves, which Mike isn't really big on, on just the, uh, uh, making your acquaintance, you know, he wants to get right into like, you know, the, the real deal. And keep in mind, these physical therapists working me out. I actually broke my right arm in the accident. And, and so I was just working out my left arm and, and, uh, and I just remember this vividly that Mike was like, kind of like, well, why don't we get you up out of that chair? Come work out with us. And like, we'll do all these things. And I was, even then I was, even though I was down, like that just, you know, and you know, his voice, I mean, that just picks you up. He could be saying anything and you'd be just all about it. Whatever you say, man, let's do it. And, and he just, let's get you up. On, and I just remember the physical therapist kind of pulling the side, like a parent might do. And then they're talking to the side. I'm like hearing everything they're saying, like they're right in front of me, but they're whispering, like, you know, like maybe yeah. she's just like, yeah, he, he's not going to walk again. Like this is a spinal cord injury. And the, those nerves don't heal like they might in a, an ACL injury if the nerves get damaged or whatever. Like, it's not the same. And Mike just kind of nods. And, they, and then they separate. After I heard it all, I'm kind of, you know, kind of deflated. Me, like, what the heck? You know, like, just let him do his thing. And so anyway, he just, he goes, so when do you want to come work out with us? Like, when are you going to be ready to, to just get after it? We'll get you up out of that chair. You'll be walking and all this. And And I just, that lady just like, it was like, oh my God, you don't say that to somebody, which I wouldn't recommend it unless you, unless you can back it up, which Mike absolutely did. And it, he basically made me feel like if you don't come work out with me, I'm going to be the most disappointed person in the world. And and uh, in any ways, I, I mean, Mike, he follows through with his actions. You know, he didn't he didn't just say, hey, you know, maybe stop by sometime or maybe we can make some time for you here. That was a huge difference that a lot of times even even with going into physical therapy, well, we could try to squeeze in the schedule here, but it's going to be a challenge and nobody wants to be an inconvenience. Mm -hmm. And Mike was just like, you are like killing me. Like I got to work with you, man. Like, please, you know, and I felt like I was uh, just the biggest number one superstar in the world. He just wanted the chance to work with me. And it was, couldn't be more, you know, further from the truth at that moment. And, and obviously I eventually did say yes, but I mean, it is, he's, he's a guy that, you want to follow through with and and I would love seeing recruits come through because he would do all the things that are important to him about the core and all those things. And as soon as they would leave, he didn't change a thing. Like he's the most genuine person I've ever met. And, uh, and it's been just, I don't know. It's just, it's just, um, totally inspired me to be that kind of person every day. And I, I, I I sometimes go back and forth on whether he's like this genius guru or if he is is just this uh, super talented God given ability guy that, that isn't smart because he always makes a jokes and oh I don't I don't have much upstairs but I'm God gave me some talents you know and he always does that spiel but early on he had told me that you know, that he said he had prayed about it and, and he believed that he was supposed to help me. He knew he was supposed to help me. And he said, he said that, you know, that, that I was going to be able to give back to other people. He's like, don't give, he's like, Mike said, don't, you don't have to give me anything. I'm all good, but there's going to be somebody that's going to need something from you. And, and don't, don't go away. Don't turn away from that. And that was the only thing he ever asked of me. And he said, you, you're going to have a gift and you're going to be able to go you know, spread it. And, and you wanted me to do that. And at the time I'm like, I ain't got anything going for me. Like I can't do anything for anybody. And, and, and so as it's all come full circle and we started the first step foundation and we've trained people to try to emulate Mike, to work with people with disabilities and do all those things. And I've been able to go and speak to raise money for the foundation. And, and life has just opened up for me at one time. The only thing I wanted was opportunity, like just give me some opportunity, God, like something to look forward to, something to work towards. And and now it's just I'm flooded with it. And even being on this podcast, I'm so grateful for. But I, I just look back and I'm like, did Mike have that planned all along? And even with banning the wheelchair from the gym, which in some people like that's cruel. You can't ban a wheelchair, you know, and and uh, and I look back because I, I would forget that I had the wheelchair and when I would go out of the gym and see it and I'm crawling, but I still would be kind of taken aback, like, you know, what is this? And and I'm and then I kind of think about it because I'm like, wait, was Mike already planning this all along or was it just kind of a fun camaraderie th thing to like kind of make me go through the 
uh, jump through the hoop, so to speak. But, um, but anyways, I, yeah, I look at Mike and just think, man, this guy, uh, even not having the experience is, uh, and I would say, um, in addition to his voice, he has, he has grit just because he, he never stops. I mean, if, if he had somebody come in there that heard my story or otherwise through a friend, he had, he had multiple people come through that gym that just, Hey, I know a guy who knows a guy who knows you. And he said, you might be able to help me with my stroke or this brain surgery I had. And he stays after, and it might be seven or eight o'clock at night. Like I said, when I would get done and he would stay and he would work with them. And, and just that, I mean, you just, you don't find that very often someone that genuine and follows through with their, their, uh, their words and into action. I mean, and, uh, and that's just, that's what he's, uh, I couldn't say enough about what he's been to me, but in a nutshell. Hey, real quick, before we go to Elliot and he can talk about Mike, describe that moment, you know, cause we, a lot of times, you know, as leaders and, and both as uh, soldiers, there's a lot of moments that you're dealing with fear. And then, you know, Mike would share his best quote that he shares with his young, you know, kids, from the moment that they can walk or they can speak, he would say, what is fear? I mean, his kids would respond with fear is a liar. And so a lot of times, you know, those challenges and, and the fear of failing is what a lot of times anybody, but including our soldiers and leaders, that causes this hesitancy to take action. But as you kind of went through this journey, just share with the team, you know, and he, he mentioned it and he talked that he had dirt in his eye you know, when it was going on, but that moment that you walk from the sideline of the 50 yard in front of 113,000 people for the first time. Yeah. Mike actually came up. I was sitting in my wheelchair in the tunnel and it's dark and, and he just gave me one of his hugs and he leaned down. I mean, right in my ear, he's just like, are you scared? And I said, I am so, I'm, I'm like shaken. Like I am, I am scared to death. And and he, uh, you know, he t- I, I remember he, he quoted he quoted the Bible verse that if God's for us, who who could be against us? But he said, he said, there's not one person in that stadium that's not going to want to see you succeed today. And uh, and then, uh, you know, he said they'll be booing us or we'll be booing them, you know. But he's like, in that moment, everyone's going to want to see you succeed. And he said, if you if you fell every person is going to stand up and cheer even harder, you know, for you to get back up again. And, uh, and it literally, it lifted the weight of the world off my shoulders. And what I would say about what I would say about that is, yeah, fear is absolutely a liar. And I thought I was going crazy in the gym because, you know, I'd hear that, but you're going to fall again. You just fell like yesterday you fell. Now he wants you to walk twice as far. Like you're, of course you're going to fall. Like, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. And, and I finally did just replace that, that inner voice that we all have. I replaced it with Mike's voice for better or worse. You know, there's times that I go through the drive through and it just, and then I leave and I'm like, God, dang, like, stay away from McDonald's, you know, I'm like, Jesus, you know, like I'm just trying to live my life. But, uh, but I've replaced that voice completely. And it's my own voice. It's my own voice in my head. And now it's, um, you know, it's just constantly, it's Mike, like, like, you know, it's just, you got this and push forward. But that, that moment I stood up out of the chair and walked, I always describe that because I always asked Elliot, what, what's that like? So I can't describe it. I'm like, what does that mean? You can't describe it, you know? And, <laughs> and, uh, and now I know what he means, you know, until you've lived it. And, and it was absolutely surreal. And I actually, I think, yeah, the week before I, I was trying to walk without, uh, without canes, but I could not get a really a full step in. So I tried walking with one cane and I actually rolled my ankle and it was solid black and blue. And I remember Parker Whiteman, uh, one of Mike's assistants that always worked with me. He, uh, he said, that looked like it hurt. And I said, yeah, it does look like it hurt, didn't it? And, and I didn't feel a thing. I didn't feel any of it. <laughs> we walked it off. And I mean, I've never, I've, I've had some sprained ankles, but I've never seen a, like a black and blue ankle like that was. And, and, uh, but the, and so I, I had failed during the week just walking. I mean, probably half the time, if not more, I would fall. But when I walked out in the field that day and stood up, all the sound drowned out. I had complete tunnel vision. And it was just me and this banner. And, and it really was like a conveyor belt at the airport. 
it was just like I'm just floating out to the banner. I mean, it was absolutely surreal, and uh, and and I still can't believe it. But like the moment I touched the banner, like the sound came back, and I was just back, and I was kind of like, whoa, like all right, you know, I'm holding one hand in the air, which was really big challenge then, and uh, and I'm just kind of getting my bearings back, like okay, oof, all right, oh yeah, I have to get off the field before I get run over by all these players <laughs> and uh and uh and absolutely surreal i i uh and i didn't really get to take it in until right after but i think the most powerful moment i had that day uh one of the ushers had my wheelchair and he was super excited like he's the he's the wheelchair handler for me you know like he thought it was a huge deal and he ran up to me like i got your chair i got your chair and then they announced the national anthem and i just stopped and i mean and I had, I got a bunch of dust in my eyes. So I know what Mike was talking about. I don't know who's kicking up all the dust, but, <laughs> but that was, that was the first time that I was able to, or really had the opportunity. I felt comfortable. I felt empowered really. And I said, no, I don't want to sit down right now. And they had the national anthem. And, and, uh, as a side note, my first trip out of the hospital, uh, back in January was to a Michigan hockey game. And when they announced the national anthem, like, please rise for the national anthem. I, I was balling at, on the glass at this hockey arena, Yost arena, just balling my eyes out because I just was, I was like having a good time at the hockey. And I was just like, like, Oh my God. Like, cause I, I'd never, uh, you know, experienced, I couldn't, couldn't stand up. And, uh, and so just, yeah, it's just standing and, and taking it all in at the stadium and, and hearing the national anthem and, and seeing all that, I was just, I was like, wow. And and the only thing I could really, really uh, envision is uh, just my dad and Hollis. Just like, as much as we've gone through so much um, challenge and conflict uh, in that moment, it was just kind of like them smiling down, like like they know it's hard, but but you need to know that you know, that, uh, that God's in control and that his hands are on it. Because I, I was looking at that, like, there's no way I graduated a year before from Ohio state in my wheelchair. And, and now here I am at Michigan stadium and had, had walked out of my wheelchair. And so, I mean, just so many things that came together for me and, and have since then with the ups and downs. But, but in that moment, it was just like, you know, everything was, was right in the world. And it's like, it's going to be okay. And I mean, that was just extremely powerful. And I, I love the fact that we were able to share that with, you know, with so many people, that special moment, you know, it really was. That's an incredible story. How about you, Elliot? Um, you know, yeah, to, uh, that, that moment was really unbelievable. I think Mike put it the best way. Um, uh, I guess I can paraphrase for him, but it, it really was a healing moment for our family to see Brock accomplish that. I mean, I can remember him, you know, just barely being able to kind of flip his foot in the air a little bit. And we were like, my God, he can, you know, he can move his foot again. And to go from that and having a guy, uh, a catalyst like Mike Barwis and, and you know, his assistants uh, that really drove Brock, I mean, it really was a healing moment for our family and, and, uh, you know, yeah. And then I, you know, I'm, I've got the, the dust in my eyes too. And I, I'm running out to play a football game. You know, I ran back out with my team and we ran out, you know, so it was, uh, uh, but it was, it was certainly a special moment. I can't tell you how many people I've met in the craziest circumstances that have been like, I was at that game. I was there. I saw it, you know, and, and, I've had so many experiences where I've met people, even here in LA, I'll be, you know, somehow a guy through a teammate through a thing. And they'll say like, Oh, I, I watched that game. I remember. And it's like, did you really? And they're, they're like, no, 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 your brother. Yeah. I remember the story. So it really does when I, you know, say it, uh, you know, even him walking out, someone that had seen that part of the story can say that really inspired me because I had this thing that was happening and see your brother do that. Um, so it's real rewarding to see that and, and um, you know, uh, and then taking it back to Mike Barwis, I mean, I I, uh, I can cert certainly say his voice is still in my head and, uh, you know, I still talk to teammates and I mean, we all have stories. I mean, I could, I could do a whole, several episodes on different stories, different things. Remember when so-and-so had this and then Mike came over and did that? So those stories still fly around. 
And it's so funny to me because when I look back at it, um, you know, to this day, I've never worked as hard as I did than when the, the three years Mike was at Michigan. Um, taking you places you can't take yourself, uh, that is certainly, and I still don't take myself to those places when I work out. I still work out a lot, but I do have his voice in my head. I'm, even if it's just do 10 push ups, and you know, you're like, the whole, every push up, it's Mike, one, two, Three, there you go. Don't be a pussy. You know, I'll say, <laughs> I know I'm doing 10 push ups. I can do it, Mike. I don't need to get my head. It's like, well, he's I, still there. So I've had so many repeat reps. <laughs> do it again. That's the, you look like I, I know when I haven't done that full squat, I kind of half assed it. And it's like, no, that don't. I'm like, God he's, dang it. He's, he's uh, yeah, he, he's, he's definitely still, still in your head. And I have teammates that say the same thing. So it's funny because. When I was going through it, I mean, I, I couldn't, I just, uh, in those moments, I always thought to myself, I was like, man, I cannot wait. I mean, this is just, you know, you'd be running and we'd be conditioning and he'd add something on. And then he'd, and you'd go, okay, usually this is the last thing. And then he'd add another thing and you're just like, I physically cannot do it. I physically, I mentally, I can't even do it. Like I can't even fathom. And yet you somehow do it. You know, even if you're crawling your way through the finish line, you somehow do it. And, uh, and he's your biggest fan. He's your biggest fan for doing it. While you're doing it, it's come on, you little, you know, pussy, freaking get this done or whatever. And, it, and, it's, and he'll do whatever he's got to call you to get you motivated. But as soon as you finish, and you, you know, you, you made your time or you benched it as many times as you could, he's the first one coming and hugging you and saying, I knew you could do it. You know, so it's good to have some he, – he's, he's a very unique person, but it is good to have people similar to that in your life. And, uh, you know, being Mike, being as unique as he is, he, he still lives in my head when I'm working out, even now, you know, I'm doing acting, I go into an audition and, uh, you know, you go into an audition and there's, you know, sometimes there's 10 people sitting in there and they're all like watching you and giving you nut. I'm like, I get nervous for that. It's like, that's nothing compared to a Mike Barrow's Friday morning run, uh, you know, in the summertime in the middle of July. Like if I could get through that stuff, everything else is, uh, you know, so much more simple. So, uh, so it, it, it's, uh, working with Mike and, and having known him and, and having, you know, I, even when I tried to play pro ball, Mike trained me then. Um, so I've had a lot of experience with him, and, uh, it's still paying off. It's still benefiting me, even though I don't see him, I don't talk to him all the time. It's still benefiting me in life to know that he took me somewhere I couldn't go. And, and it really makes you have to push yourself that much more to say, I know I'm capable of more. Uh, in all aspects of life. So it's, you know, you can't, uh, you, you really can't buy that. You can't fake that. It's, uh, it's been something that's stuck with me all these years. I really appreciate you sharing with, you know, thanks to both you guys taking the time to sit down with us and really sharing with the team, who are the Mueller brothers sharing your story. It's really an inspirational, not just about grit and resilience, but it's really about this incredible relationship that you guys have about unconditional love and really making a positive impact. Even though you experienced an incredibly tragic, you know, crucible moment that you both were a part of, you have found a way and you walk away being an inspiration for anybody. So that's listening to this, that may be going through something difficult. And as you shared with, you know, don't forget the lessons that you've learned from the individuals and have taught you from the beginning you know, surround yourself by some incredibly positive people and don't be afraid of the Mike Barwises in your life because they're going to give you the love that you need, not necessarily the love that you want. And when the, the team's listening, we always end with uh, what are your questions, but I'd like to leave the final word with you. And I'll start with you, Elliot, first. Well, I think you, uh, I think you hit the nail on the head there. I'm always, I'm always on the lookout for the next, uh, you know, Mike Barwis in your life where it's like, man, this guy's going to give me the, may, he may not make me go running or something, but somebody that's going to give you the truth and, and, and tell you what you need to hear. And, and, and also, you know, maybe give you the, the kind of guidebook to get through it. And so, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm in the acting world again. I went, you know, I went to square one and I've worked my way up over the years here. And, uh, you know, there have been people in my life that have said, hey, man, this is what you need to do. And it's kind of like, oh, I didn't think I needed to do that. It's like, yeah, you need to do this. You need to do this. Go here. And, uh, 
so it helps you kind of be on the lookout for people like that to, to make you your best self. And um, I'm a firm believer in that now to be surrounded by people like Mike, like my teammates, like the people in uh, our community that lifted us up after our tragedy really helps, makes you want to look out for those people and be surrounded by uh, people that are going to make you your best self. So uh, that's kind of my, my last thing. And uh, Brock. Well, ditto on that. Like, don't be afraid of those Mike Barwisses, you know, because like I said, I feel like all the time people tell me, oh, I'd love to work out with them sometime. And it's just like, no, no, you wouldn't, you know, and you <laughs> would if you had the commitment, if you had the goal in front of you, like, absolutely, that's the thing to do. But don't be afraid of that. If, if that person is going to drive you to be the person you want to be, then then go for it and go all in. And I will leave you with one of my favorite bar wisdoms, as we call them. But uh, I, I didn't I didn't even remember this until years later as I'm I'm talking at events. And I think it just kind of came out. And then someone comes up and says, I love what you said there. And I'm like, did I say that? And I didn't even you know remember. But but I remember one day, I, Mike could always, he is so, he is so good at reading people. I mean, I think emotionally, but physically, certainly. And he would always know when I was just totally, totally out, which like Elliot said, I think I would average about five times that my tank was empty and he would make me go further until I stopped even telling him that I couldn't go forward. But he he would stop and say, okay, you're done. Now you're done. Now the tank's empty. And he, he thanked me for like giving my all and all that. And uh, he'd say, uh, you'll be back tomorrow, right? And I always remember because it was a, like a Thursday. So it'd be easy to get that three-day weekend. And it's like, yeah, I, I, five days a week, I'd work out with him for like seven, eight hours. And, and I'm like, yeah, it's Friday. Like, of course I'll be back. I don't even know what you're, what do you mean? He's like, well, that's good. He's like, he, he's like, you know what happens if you don't show up tomorrow, right? And I, my initial thought was like, God, I'm going to lose my damn scholarship. Oh, wait, I don't have a scholarship. Like, what, <laughs> what could you do that would be possibly worse than making me go all the way into like, until I can't go anymore? And it always, well, you can't make me do extra. Like I'm already like, you know, <laughs> And anyway, I was just so confused by that. And at this point, I had built a pretty good relationship with Mike, but I was just confused. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what happens if I don't show up tomorrow. And he's just like, you never want to find out. And then he just tapped me on the leg and he left. And I I always uh, remember being sitting there being confused, like, and it because it was like, is he serious or kind of joke? I'm like, I think he's serious. And, and uh, but the thing I love about that when I share that story is that, I look back and I'm like, if I didn't show up on that Friday, I wouldn't have walked out on the field. You know, if I didn't show up on that Friday, I wouldn't get to travel around and and share my story. I wouldn't be able to be on this podcast. I wouldn't be able to go back and believe I could go do my MBA. Like I would have missed out on so much. And, and I always try to push or press that upon people too. Is that like, you, you always think that like not showing up for work, you lose your job, you get punished or what, like think about what it is you're trying to do and what you're trying to accomplish as a whole as a habit, because that long-term goal, that's what you're going to miss, you know, not, not getting, uh, you know, in trouble or yelled at or something like you're going to miss out on, on, I'm not giving yourself your best and you're going to miss out on reaching that full potential. And I always, uh, think of I always think about that moment with Mike. Mike's voice in my head is like, "If you don't show up tomorrow, I'm like I don't want to find out what happens if I don't show up. So I'll just be there and live in the now." I know guys that didn't show up every once in a while, so it's not it's not a good experience if you don't. <laughs> I have yeah, I have seen the people. <laughs> you miss a workout or you show up late, you're uh, you're in some trouble. So that's uh, that's funny. Well, I really appreciate it, guys. Go ahead. Uh, I wanted to throw in and I, I almost forgot it, but um, there may be, so, you know, somebody that could benefit from it. It's not really a plug because I'm, I'm just a member, but I am a part of a, an organization called Merging Vets and Players. And it's for mil- military uh, veterans and former professional athletes. So, uh, you know, it's we call it MVP. But it's uh, it gives you a kind of gets you back on the team again uh, when you when you get out of uh, the service when you're now no longer in a locker room and, and having discussions like we're having right now, you know, sometimes you can feel lost without your teammates. And, uh, it's something that's helped me that I've been a part of for about a year now. And, uh, it's a virtual thing. You get on and do little chats like this with all across the country. There's a lot of guys involved and, uh, 
there may be some, you know, military veterans uh, or former athletes that want to be a part of it. You can check it out. Oh, that's great. We'll definitely share that with your team. Well, hey, guys, I really appreciate taking the time. It was a great session. And, uh, you know, the last thing I'll leave with you is, you know, if you get a chance, we're trying to set it up. I know you guys are both incredibly busy, but we'd love to have you out, you know, up here in the Northwest. And uh, we usually run a squad competition, and we got another one coming right before Thanksgiving. So about 160 squads and finishes up here in the brigade headquarters. And I told uh, Mike about it, and Mike's like, yeah, maybe I can be out there with them. So All right. All right. we'd love to see you guys. I, I like it. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll twist his arm. We, we need to make that happen. <laughs> would, It'd be great. Oh, yeah. Well, I appreciate it, you know, and I know Onda reached out to you guys. And so, you know, it's inspirational what you guys are doing. It's incredibly brave. It shows a lot of courage to share in the story. And, and I know that the leaders here in this organization and our soldiers would love, you know, to sit down with you guys one-on-one and, and just hear and just talk to you guys and just you showing up, your presence would mean a lot. We'll make that happen. We'll make that happen. We appreciate you guys having us on to give us uh, an opportunity to share our story. And like I said, if it benefits or encourages uh, one person, then that uh, you know that's that's rewarding for us and, and, and makes us happy. We can uh, take a tragedy and, and turn it into something positive. Absolutely. Well, you guys take care. You as Thanks well. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Guys. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Leadership Experience. If you like what you heard, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget to subscribe to keep up to date with the newest podcast. The Leadership Experience will showcase professionals within five different subseries. Number one, Masters of Our Craft, the Essence of Warfighting. Number two, Students of Our Profession, as we understand organizational culture and concepts of leadership. Number three, Professional Athletes with Guns, as we talk hardships and maintaining a competitive advantage. Number four, grit and resiliency, the ability to overcome and perform under pressure. And number five, safe and secure environment, as we talk soldier well-being and building trust within our organization and the profession as whole. 